Here's something really cool. All three spacecraft currently capable of taking humans to the International Space Station are all docked up there right now at the same time. Now, Dragon, Starliner, and Soyuz, they're all space capsules. But the spacecraft that primarily built the International Space Station, the space shuttle, was a space plane. So why do we have two radically different spacecraft designs? space plane and the space capsule. And why did we go back to the capsule after we already had the plane? And also one more question, will we get a space plane again in the future? We're gonna dive into all of that and more in this video. But before we do, hi, I'm Camille. If you're new here, I am an aerospace engineer turned space tech content creator. So if you like space tech and wanna stay up to date with news and insights and more, please consider subscribing and liking this video. If we go all the way back to the dawn of the space age, and we look at the Mercury, Gemini, or Apollo spacecraft, even the Russia Soyuz spacecraft actually, we can see they're all capsule style. Capsules are simple and safe. They're designed to do one thing and they do it really well, get astronauts and their cargo and science to space and back safely. Their simple cone shape makes them super stable when they re-enter Earth's atmosphere. So the astronauts are always seated behind the heat shield as it darts through the air. And the blunted heat shield creates a bow shock wave that actually dissipates heat away from the capsule, further protecting the astronauts. TLDR, they're reliable, they're safe, they work. They did get us to the moon after all. But back then, each capsule was only used once. No reusability whatsoever. So in 1968, yes, before we had even landed on the moon, NASA was already thinking about a reusable spacecraft. So they went to engineers and they said, design a reusable space plane. It needs to launch like a rocket and land like an airplane. It's gonna have really low G-forces on the way back down instead of the high G-forces that you get with a capsule. And it needs to be reusable up to 100 times with turnaround times of only two weeks. It is the determination of how mankind can live in harmony on the finite globe we call Earth. The space shuttles were great for building the International Space Station and launching cool payloads like the Hubble Space Telescope and shuttling, quite literally, hundreds of astronauts back and forth from space for three decades. But in reality, they were really complex and expensive. None of them ever actually flew 100 times, and the turnaround time was more like three months, not two weeks. So after 30 years, NASA canceled the space shuttle program with no plan B. In fact, from 2011 to 2020, the only way to get a human to space was on Russia's Soyuz, which as you can imagine, is not an ideal situation for the US government to be in. But NASA didn't want to build another space shuttle. For starters, they didn't want to build and operate anything because it costs a lot of money. They wanted the private sector to do that. They also didn't want another space plane, at least not right away for crew. Not only were they concerned with the cost and complexity we've already talked about, but the space shuttle wasn't exactly very safe. There was no launch abort system, and of course we did have those two tragic accidents, one of which we had just come off of, Columbia, when they started to think about what comes after the space shuttle. So NASA went to the private sector and said, hey, we need you to build us the next generation spacecraft that will take crew to the International Space Station. They also did this for cargo, but we'll get to that in a bit. And NASA said, we'll pay you for some of it. Basically, we will invest in this. You build it, you design it, you operate it. Then once you certify it to our NASA standards, then we'll pay you to fly our astronauts and cargo to the International Space Station. And out of this commercial crew program, or CCP as it's called, we got SpaceX's Crew Dragon, and now Boeing Starliner, which of course has been all over the news. And if you've been seeing the news, Starliner is on its first crewed test flight, but it is four years behind SpaceX, despite receiving significantly more money in the initial contract. But once fully certified, Starliner will be able to carry up to seven astronauts to the International Space Station. Dragon can carry four right now, used to carry seven, but then they had some design changes. But regardless, a typical ISS expedition is for crew members. Reusability is of course a huge consideration here, and that was one of the benefits of the space shuttle compared to the earlier capsules. Now, thanks to more advanced materials and technologies, capsules can be reusable. Starliner is reusable up to 10 times and Dragon up to 15. Both of them are designed for low Earth orbit trips only, and they can stay docked to the ISS for up to seven months at a time. Now, to get to the ISS, to get to space, Dragon launches on a SpaceX Falcon 9, of course, and Starliner launches on a ULA Atlas V. In terms of cargo capacity to the ISS, though slightly smaller than Starliner, Dragon can carry more cargo, about 13,000 pounds versus 8,800 pounds for Starliner. Inside, you can definitely see the differences between new space and old space. Dragon features high-tech touchscreens and sleek white designs, while Starliner features a traditional cockpit with physical buttons and switches. 
And like all capsules, these are very good at getting crew safely to the ISS and back. But for those of you like myself missing the space plane era for whatever reasons it may be, don't worry, there is a commercial one in development, Sierra Space's Dream Chaser. Right now it's only designed to carry cargo to the International Space Station and this is through NASA's Commercial Resupply Services Program, which is the sister to the Commercial Crew Program, CCP. Now a really interesting piece of history is that Dream Chaser was actually funded through CCP for the longest time, but then they were cut at the last minute right before the program to actually like design and build Dragon and Starliner. NASA claimed this was because they didn't think Sierra Nevada Corporation, who is now Sierra Space, could deliver on time, which is honestly comical given how Starliner is so delayed now, but anyways, I think there's also an element, again, that NASA wasn't ready for a space plane for crew, and I don't know if we are yet. Like, we were coming off of a really tragic accident when all of this was starting a couple decades ago now, but NASA had already invested $300 million into Dream Chaser's development. So if they didn't have the risk tolerance for crew, at least they did for cargo. There are no plans for NASA to fund a crewed version, but Sierra Space is planning to raise private equity to build a crewed version in the future. The cargo version hasn't had its maiden flight yet, but it's supposed to next year, 2025, on a ULA Vulcan Centaur rocket. Anytime it goes to the ISS, it can carry up to 12,000 pounds of cargo, which is roughly equivalent to what Dragon can carry. But when it re-enters Earth's atmosphere, of course it lands like a plane. It glides gently, there's no high G forces, and it lands on a runway. Now for NASA missions, Dream Chaser will land on the Space Shuttle's landing facility at Kennedy Space Center, but it can land on any commercial runway in the world, which is really cool to think about. Like, you could see a space plane landing with your airplane at an airport near you in the future. And this would dramatically increase access to space for not only people, but also science and medicine and technology and, and so many other things that we need rapid access to when it gets back to Earth. <laughs> But all of what we talked about is just for the ISS. But the ISS is supposed to come down in 2030. So what happens after that? Where does all of this work go? Thankfully, there are a few commercial space stations currently in development to replace the ISS. And of course, those will need cargo resupplies and crew expeditions. So these spacecraft, all of the ones we just talked about, can be used for those. In fact, it's already been announced that Dragon is going to send crew to Bass Haven 1 space station in 2025. And Dream Chaser and Starliner plan to support the Orbital Reef Station, which is a joint venture between between Sierra Space and Jeff Bezos' Blue Origin. There's also a new European equivalent of NASA's commercial crew program, so we can see that the global space industry is really ramping up its efforts and access to low Earth orbit. The two companies that are in that are Talos Alenia Space, based out of France, and the exploration company based out of Germany. India and China also have their own variants of cargo and crew spacecraft for either free-flying missions, aka you're just up there in your spacecraft, or docked to a space station. But beyond space station missions, Dragon is really cool because it can be and has already been used for private individual missions to low Earth orbit. The first one was in 2021 called Inspiration4, if you've heard of it. Basically, a billionaire, Jared Isaacman, decided he wanted to go to space and also raise money for St. Jude and do a bunch of research in space. And so he paid SpaceX for four seats and took people up there for three or four days. And he's actually doing that again with a new mission called Polaris Dawn, which is supposed to be launched this month, maybe next, we'll see. They're actually enhancing Dragon to support these missions because they want to do cool and unique things on each one of them. So for Inspiration4, they put a cupola on Dragon so the astronauts could see out and see Earth because what's the fun if you can't do that? And then on Polaris, they're actually going to depressurize the whole capsule and open it up to do the first commercial spacewalk, which is insane. But they aren't building any more Dragon spacecraft, so eventually they will be phased out and most likely replaced by Starship. Now Starship is a really interesting new type of spacecraft, right? Because it's not a capsule, but it's not a space plane. It's a rocket that takes off. It does have two stages, but the top of it, Starship itself, can carry humans and cargo to space, and then it can come back down and land on Earth at the landing site. Now, when we think about longer term missions to the moon and Mars, that's where things get really interesting for spacecraft. So right now, the only way to get humans to Mars is a capsule, Orion, and it looks very, very, very similar to Apollo. Now, a cool tidbit of history is that Orion was actually supposed to be a space plane like the space shuttle because they started developing it during the space shuttle era. But NASA changed its mind partway through the initial development, probably because of the cost and complexity and safety concerns. And they changed it back to a capsule and said, you know what, actually, let's just reuse a lot of 
about the Apollo things. We're not gonna reinvent the wheel. Which honestly, given how long it has taken to develop Orion, even with using a lot of the same Apollo parts, it's probably a good thing that we did that. Anyways, Orion is great for reliable and routine back and forth shipments and expeditions to the moon with a safe spacecraft, but it can only support four crew members for up to 21 days. That's not gonna cut it for longer trips to Mars or sending lots of people to a permanent moon outpost. Most likely, we're gonna see Starship emerge as the de facto choice for big long-term missions to the moon and Mars. That's ultimately what it was designed for in the first place. We could also see space station-like vehicles assembled around the moon and then a crew capsule like Orion or a beefier version could attach to it and go to Mars like in For All Mankind. But right now, Orion is the only spacecraft that can safely get humans to the moon and back and we'll just have to see what happens once we actually start going back to the moon. So there you have it in a nutshell, space planes versus space capsules. And even though this was a, I don't know, roughly 10 minute video, this is just scratching the surface. So let me know if you're interested in learning more about any of these spacecraft. See you next time.